Okay, Craig, I think I got it figured out. You got what figured out? How we can believe everything we see. Oh yeah? How's that now? Hear me out. If we want to be absolutely confident in our perceptions of the world, we need only one thing. And that is? A photographic memory. A photographic Yeah, you know, it's the ability to remember everything in a scene just by taking a look at it. Like your mind's taking a picture. They do it in movies and TV all the time. I'm not even sure photographic memory is possible. Sure it is. All right, I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to go into my mind palace, ask me about anything in the room we're in, and I'll remember it. Hmm. How many dots are on the ceiling? Um, that's a trick question. There are no dots on the ceiling. Oh man, there's a ton of dots on the ceiling. Why all the dots? So does photographic memory even exist? It's got to exist, right? So there are people out there that actually have photographic memory? Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe you should ask an expert. Okay. There's the idea of the photographic memory. Is that a thing? Is that real? Uh, it depends what you mean by it. So the idea that you can take a single glance at an image, for example, and remember it in perfect detail like a photograph, is nonsense. This is Dan Simons, a cognitive scientist and an expert on how we perceive the world. It, it can't be true. And there's a simple way to prove this. We simply don't have the resolution of visual information coming into our eye and then entering our brain and becoming part of our awareness. It doesn't have that kind of resolution. The way to think about how much detail you have when you look at the world is to hold your arm out like this at arm's length, stick your thumb up, and the width of your thumb is the area that you have in a lot of detail. That's the area of the page you're looking at when you read. And the rest of the page is basically blurry. But we don't realize that because we move our eyes three or four times a second when we're looking out at the world, and everywhere we look, it's detailed. The idea that you could take a single snapshot of the world and be able to see everything at once can't work. Our eye is not like a camera with perfect depth of field everywhere. It's more like a portrait photograph where everything kind of blends and is blurred in the background. Okay, so photographic memory appears to be a myth. But there's got to be people with really good memory. That has to exist, right? Absolutely, yeah. So there, there are a number of documented and well-documented cases of exceptional memory. I knew one of them, for example. His name was George Kel Koltanowski. He was the world blindfold chess champion. He would play a game of chess blindfold. So you tell me your move, and he would then, in his mind, say, OK, here's my move and somebody else would move the pieces for him. So he'd, he'd do a whole game like that. Wow. Now that's not hard. Right? Most serious tournament chess players can do at least one game blindfolded pretty well. Mm. Uh, grandmasters might be able to play a number of them. He played 35 at once <laughs> and didn't lose any of them. Wow. Right? An exceptional memory. Yeah. Right? The question is, is it qualitatively different from the rest of us, or is it just at the one extreme end of the continuum? Is he just that particularly really good memory person, and there are other people at the other end who are really bad memory people, um, there's a lot of variability there. Well, most people don't have a memory good enough to play blindfolded chess. Yeah, they're way worse. You've done some videos that, mm -hmm. that are up, up there on YouTube that we've seen. Um, could you describe those? Uh, the first one I did was uh, a long time ago with my colleague Dan Levin, and we were interested in a phenomenon known as change blindness. So this is the tendency to not notice large changes to a scene from one moment to the next when we're really focused intently on something. In, in that particular study, the one that's on YouTube and has gotten a lot of views, I would walk up to you and ask for directions on campus. And while you're kindly giving me directions, a couple of people come by carrying a big wooden door and pass right between us. And as the door is between us, we swap me out for somebody else. And about 50% of the people don't realize that they're talking to somebody else. Nice talking to you. Yeah, you too. And only you. I'm the only one you talk to. That's right. Wow. Yeah, it, it was surprising to us. We didn't think it would work. What was striking about the change blindness effects that mostly emerged in the early to mid 1990s was that the changes were huge. It wasn't just that people failed to notice things. It's that they failed to notice things that they think they would notice. So their beliefs about what they would notice, what they would remember, were radically different from what they actually did notice and, and remember. That's crazy. Yeah, and that's not all. There's also inattentional blindness. Laid on me. So change blindness is a failure to notice that something is different from the way it was before. Right? So it's a failure of memory, in a sense. Inattentional blindness is a failure to notice something that's right there, fully visible, in the here and now, because your attention is focused on something else. Our best known experiment on that was one I did with Chris Chabri uh, back in the late 1990s again. And in that task, we had people watch a video. And in the video, there were three people wearing white shirts passing a basketball around. Sometimes they'd bounce past it, sometimes they pass it in the air, but they're passing this ball. And all you have to do when you're watching this video is count how many times they complete a pass. So relatively straightforward, but still pretty hard. But we also had three people wearing black shirts passing their own ball, and you were supposed to ignore their passes. And as you're doing this task, after about 30 seconds, 
a woman wearing a full body gorilla suit walks into the scene, turns and faces the camera, thumps her chest, and then walks off the other side and is on screen for about nine seconds. And what we find is, again, about half the people who view this don't see the gorilla. And if you ask them about it, so did you notice anything unusual you know, while you were doing this? Said, no. And then you rewind the tape, it was tape in those days, rewind the tape, show it to them again, and they'll say, I missed that? There's no way, that's a different tape. Right? They're so persuaded by their experience of noticing things that it's completely counterintuitive that you could miss something that obvious right in front of you. Okay, this brings up a rather scary predicament. If we're so bad at noticing and remembering details, how does this affect something important like eyewitness testimony? Doesn't our legal system depend on our ability to accurately recall details and facts? Yeah, I guess that would be a real problem. Eyewitness testimony is an area that's been studied for more than 40 years now in, in cognitive psychology. And there's a general finding that people don't realize that when you recall something really vividly, you assume that your memory is accurate. Often when people initially witness something, they have a memory of it, but that memory can change over time and actually can increase in your, your confidence in that memory over time to the point that you actually remember the wrong thing but are really certain of it. And that's what leads to false convictions, for example. According to the Innocence Project, a public policy organization that crusades for the rights of the wrongfully convicted, mistaken identity accounts for 72% of all wrongful convictions that were later overturned by DNA evidence. 72%? And that's just the cases we know about. Just think of all the cases where somebody is wrongfully convicted, but there was no DNA evidence to exonerate them. What our studies show, what these change blindness studies show, is that even from one moment to the next, we often don't notice pretty substantial changes. If you were put in an eyewitness situation, for example, would you be able to recognize the person you were just talking to a moment later? And the answer seems to be no. And despite how inaccurate it can be, eyewitness testimony is still one of the most commonly used pieces of evidence brought against criminal defendants. But the Innocence Project is out there pushing for reform within our legal system. Okay, legal system aside, Craig, I look around and everything seems to be there. You know, nothing's missing, there aren't any gaps. It looks like it's all there but I'm obviously missing something, probably a whole lot of things. Why does it seem like the world is complete and detailed, even though my brain is most likely ignoring huge chunks of it? There are a couple of good reasons. The first is that the world actually is really detailed and it actually is out there. And what our visual system is doing is sampling it. So you kind of take a glance over here and you take a glance over here and you kind of build up a sense of detail in the world. But I think there's also kind of a metacognitive error, an error of belief there. We assume that because everywhere we look, it's detailed, that we have those details in our head. And that's not true. So a lot of the details of the world that we can see whenever we want to, we don't actually keep track of over time. Uh, that's what the findings of change blindness seem to suggest, that we're not really storing all of that detail in our minds. So we like to think of kind of vision working like the construction of a detailed model of the entire world somewhere in our head that we can then kind of inspect later. And that doesn't seem to be the case. Right. Instead, we have bits and pieces, details that we've focused our attention on. And the really cool thing is we're aware of the things that we're aware of. But what we're aware of doesn't seem like very much. And if we weren't aware of what we're aware of, how would we know we're not aware of it? That's the problem we're running into right now. The continuous and complete world that we perceive around us just isn't because we're not aware of the things we're not aware of. It's an illusion to some extent. No, see no. That, I, think that's, I think that's an interesting take that a lot of people have. That yeah. This is all showing the failures of what we do. But the real way to think about this is how efficiently we do what we do. Right? So yeah, we don't notice people in gorilla suits walking through basketball games, which fortunately doesn't happen all that often. What we do remarkably well is focus attention. We can focus attention on what we need to see and not be distracted by all the irrelevant stuff. So imagine if we always noticed the gorilla. People sometimes ask me, how could you improve your ability to see things so that you would always see the gorilla? And I'd say you don't want to, because that would mean if I'm having a conversation with you, any random motion over here is going to distract me away from my conversation with you. I won't be able to maintain that, that narrowed focus that I need. So the failure to notice unexpected things is a side effect of something we do really, really well and we have to do really well. Well, that makes me feel a bit better. Yeah, it's okay that we don't see everything. It's essential to our survival and possibly key to our success as a species. Actually, it'd be horrible if we couldn't not notice anything. We couldn't function. We'd be eternally distracted. We should be grateful that we're not aware of everything. As long as we're aware that we're not aware of everything. Here's to being aware. Or not!
If you want to learn more about the Innocence Project and their ongoing efforts to exonerate the wrongfully convicted, go to innocenceproject.org. And if you want to check out Dan Simon's videos, go to dansimons.com. If you like this video, consider clicking that like button or subscribe to be notified when we make more videos. And if you want the show to be as continuous and complete as the world you perceive, go to Patreon. Become a supporter. Now, did you spot all the changes we made in this video? If you did, you might want to go back and give them a click. You'll get a special surprise. Good luck finding them all. That's not very subtle, Matt. Coming up next, the good stuff goes on an expedition to find a real UFO. Oh god, you're actually fully naked. Oh, do not tilt mm -hmm. the camera down. Do mm -hmm. not. It's it's a human body. It's a beautiful thing. No, don't. No, it's, it's like not a, that beautiful. It's like a piece of art a piece carved of out of ham. Weird abstract art. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>